Hello, I'm Michael Gaucher, and it is March 13, 2023, and I have a project that I've been working on that is a mirror of the project that I've worked on in Linux for several years. And so I wanted to take a program that I had designed and uh, crafted in the Linux environment, and I wanted to make its mirror, its, its uh, cousin in Microsoft Windows. And so late last year, I started developing this software program in a Windows environment so that it uses the tools, techniques, customs, and approaches that are endemic to the Microsoft Windows software development process. And so I chose C Sharp and .NET. And these are tools that I have been using since October of the year 2000. And so for greater than 20 years at this point, I have familiarity with C Sharp and .NET. .NET and C Sharp are not a, a, a static uh, type of tool set. They evolve, they get upgraded every every so often. So you may see updates, several updates to C Sharp, .NET, or something added to those platforms and frameworks every year. And then every few years, we see major updates. I wanted to get up to date on some of these major changes that have occurred um, in the intervening years since I last used .NET in an intense way. And so I picked up a book by Mark Price that um, he published in November of 2022. Perfect timing, right? And so I have been going through this book and I saw several opportunities to enhance the project that I've been working on. And so as I've brought my knowledge of .NET up to date with the most current release of .NET, which is .NET 7 and the latest version of C Sharp, which is C Sharp 11, right? 7.11, right? Um, so if you take those two, those two uh, technologies alone in Microsoft Windows, there is a tremendous opportunity to enhance your software project, but there is a path you must follow that if you have an existing .NET program project, you'll want to upgrade rather than recode from scratch, right? So in this discussion and in this session, I am going to update Visual Studio. I am going to write some code that is moving in the direction of the new .NET. And at the same time, I am going to upgrade an existing .NET 4.8 project to .NET 7, which will bring along C Sharp 11 so that there is opportunities to utilize C Sharp at its maximum potential in building and evolving this software application. The session you see before you is from January 15, 2023. I was explaining executable software and the difference between source code and executable code. And in that discussion, we saw that we could take the source code and generate executable software, even if we delete the executable software. We can use the source code as a template to regenerate that executable software. Visual Studio allows you to do this in a very convenient way. In this case, I choose the build option to take the source code and build new executable software that will run in the computer's processor. So I'm going to launch this executable and there it is. It's executing through the processor and the result is presented on the screen and this results in us having a program that we can interact with and that can fulfill certain functions for us. So the objective now is to update the tools that are used to generate software. It is now March 6, 2023 and I am updating Visual Studio. So I 
opened the Visual Studio installer and I'm conducting a check to see if there are any updates for Visual Studio. I recommend updating Visual Studio or checking for updates at least once a month. At least once a month. And this process in the Microsoft Windows environment can take anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour depending on the number of updates and if you have configured any modifications to the software. Now it is March 12th, 2023 and I had more updates to Visual Studio between the 6th and the 12th and on the 6th I just thought I would do an update check and get things prepared for this process of upgrading this program but when the 12th came along for me to actually do the updates uh, to the software program I said let's just do one more check to make sure and there was an update to Visual Studio 17.5 and I'm glad I made that that uh, decision to check and get the latest versions of the tools in place in order to produce the software in a way where all the features are at their highest level. I'm opening the, the software program, the solution to it, in Visual Studio. And I want to build it and run the software just to make sure there are no negative side effects to the updates that I had just done. And so far so good. Everything is clean. Everything is in order. The program runs as expected as it has uh, since we started this process last year. And this, this is looking good. So I want to make a, a few, um, few checks here. I want to make a few modifications. Uh, one of them is um, I want to double check the framework versions that we have available to us in the menus and I see we have 4.8 as the .NET framework available uh, through the menus uh, for for this solution so what I want to do is see if I can add newer frameworks to the system to Windows and have those available to Visual Studio so I'm going to do another update check and here I also want to examine the features and components that are available to me because it may be that you're not necessarily going to get a update to the framework or let's say that a different way. The newest versions of the .NET framework they can get installed on the system, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Visual Studio will have access to those versions. So we have these things called SDKs. It stands for Software Development Kit. And you have to have the Software Development Kit set up in such a way where it's recognized by the tools that you use in order to tap into them for the purposes of creating software. I'm also downloading .NET SDK 7 because I did not see that in the list of programs uh, or, or .NET versions when I was doing the modification. So, so I do have an update to 4.8.1 through Visual Studio, right? But I don't see .NET 7 listed in that user interface okay and the reason why I want .NET 7 is because .NET 7 is going to get get me to C sharp 11 as well so I'll be able to take advantage of the features in .NET 7 as well as C sharp 11 but right now um, we are going to work with what we have which is language improvements that have happened um, since C sharp 8 and so one of those is to be able to instantiate an instance of an object without having to 
identify the type of that object on the right hand side of the assignment operator. So I like that feature. It's very reminiscent of C++ and C++ does that um, very well. I'm also going to update some of the naming conventions that I've used and I'm encouraged to do that by the code analysis tools that are built into Visual Studio. Going all the way back to earlier versions of Visual Studio, you, you had code analysis available to you, but in those days you had to run the code analysis manually. And over time, they have produced the ability to have code analysis run automatically and it's in a more refined form and convenient form in the latest versions of Visual Studio available today. And so I decided to roll with that. Here, what I want to do is I want to simplify the code. And this is not necessarily a uh, C Sharp 8, C Sharp 9, or C Sharp 11 type of deal. Uh, this is something you could do, um, you know, in earlier versions of C Sharp and .NET. But I want to take this opportunity to uh, streamline the code so that um, I apply a bit of a generic structure to the way that I am laying out the, the user interface. So this generic structure is uh, set up in such a way so that if I need to make modifications to the way that I'm laying out these elements, I can do so in an across-the-board way, in a more comprehensive way. So this looks like um, a little bit more code, but it's actually going to lessen the amount of, of actual instructions that I use to add elements to the visual tree. So as you see here, I set up a, an array of, you, of, 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 uh, of instances that are polymorphic to the UI element type and then I can run that through a loop where I only need to define one instruction right and so in this case it's the same as running the instruction two or three times or writing out the instruction two or three times but if I need to add an if statement or if I needed to add other refinements to the instruction I can do it now I can do it just once instead of doing it two or three times you see so by collapsing the number of instructions that I need to execute or that I need to define in handwritten code as I'm doing here I improve my ability to focus in on those instructions and maximize the way that they are applied in the software program. So I've been using this technique for years and I, it is probably my favorite technique in writing software where I can achieve a maximum amount of capability with the least amount of effort. You could also say that it moves you more in the direction of a functional style uh, programming approach. So here I'm going to run the program. Unit testing is absolutely vital. Unit testing. So you want to make sure that the program functions as you expect as you make stepwise incremental improvements to the program. I will admit there are times when I will make wholesale changes like I'm doing now where I'm going to take groups of code statements and I'm going to refactor them into functions. And so in Visual Studio it's pretty easy to do control R, control E, right? Or you can do control period. I tend to do control period these days, you know, but control R, control E um, maps to refactoring to extract method, for example. So it's very easy to do these refactorings in Visual Studio. So when it comes to refactoring, um, there's really no excuse to avoid refactoring when using C Sharp and Visual Studio and Microsoft.NET. 
because that entire process is streamlined. And so all of that got to start with, in my opinion, JetBrains and um, their add-ins for Visual Studio way back in the day. But I'm glad that type of functionality and process got incorporated into Visual Studio. And I always like to drop a mention to that uh, because it's it's such a, a helpful advance. Um, and I also like the uh, sort and reorder usings. Um, I just absolutely love that. I just wish that they would have done like ReSharper Re did back in the day and you could right click on the solution and it just apply it to all the, the files. But I can also see the other argument as to why you would not do that. But I'm encapsulating the the, uh, the code statements into their own functions and um, that that is going to be uh, very helpful in terms of making the code easier to read, making the code uh, clearer to think about and work with, but it's also going to provide me a really huge advantage later on in this segment when we uh, start looking at performance optimization of this process. It is helpful to examine and review your code to see if the refactorings that you have in mind make sense. When you're writing code in one function as we started out doing here in this Windows initialize function, all the code was all in one place. But when you start segmenting them out into functions, that's also an opportunity to reorder the statements. I'm not going to do that here, but what I am going to do is do the refactoring in a slightly different way. So you can, refact you can refactor um, code statements a number of ways in Visual Studio, right? So you can select a group of statements and you can right click on that and choose to extract method. You can do control period and choose extract method. You can do control um, R, control E and extract method. Or you can do it this way where you just go ahead and write it out. Yeah write out the uh, name of the function and put everything within that function, right? Because you can define inline functions, right? You can do it in line. Um, you can do local functions in line inside of a, a, a regular function. And I did do a slight bit of reordering, but so I've taken that entire function I just defined, I just cut and I paste and instant refactoring, right? So t I took advantage of the local function uh, capabilities of Visual Studio um, so that uh, we didn't have a syntax error while editing code, but it's not a big deal even if you did, right? So, um, so I got the last group of statements that I need to extract out into a, to a, to a function. And keep in mind, the message here is not that every code statement needs to be extracted out into a function because coincidentally, we are inside of a function called private void window underscore initialize starting at line 37. But in this particular case, I have a very specific reason why I wanted all code statements refactored into their own individual functions, right? Because I have plans that relate to performance optimization and tuning that will um, be uh, quite, uh, uh, that, will, that will benefit from having these particular set of uh, codes in their own individual functions. And that's a that's actually a great technique for building out a program where you have all the functions already defined and you just go ahead and just write that code, just have at it, right? And you can also consequently just go ahead and delete out those uh, not implemented exceptions as well, just so you have 
all your sub functions in place and you can just just kind of run the program and progressively add in your functionality. Um, I don't use that technique uh, very often, um, but I do know people who do and they they absolutely love approaching uh, things that way. So performance optimization. I'm going to use background worker. The background worker class and component allows me to establish a separate thread of execution. And in this case, this particular uh, implementation of background worker does so in a way that's user interface friendly. User interfaces and threads they don't actually correspond very well depending on the way that the threading uh, models differ between user interfaces and raw threads. And that's a very, that's actually a very deep, deep topic, but I will summarize by saying that there are design patterns and ways of calling functions <coughs> that are executing on separate threads within a user interface that um, keep you um, keep things stable from a user interface standpoint. But the background worker in WPF, in .NET, in the later, ver later versions of .NET, they are much more uh, lenient about how they interact with the user interface thread. And I remember many years ago there was some, there was a design um, um, agenda to to make that a reality, and they've they've pretty much accomplished that. But they're still not 100% there. But the way that I am I updating the user interface and accessing data, um, I can go with a much more um, low complexity approach in this particular instance. But I want to do a unit test. I always want to do a unit test because <clears throat> you want to make sure that you're staying on the right track as you're moving things along. And so I have encapsulated all of my data intensive functions into separate threads by way of the background worker uh, type. And I'm doing additional refactorings so that I have more flexibility in terms of when I want certain uh, functions to, to be invoked, in terms of the sequence of their invocation. And I also want uh, flexibility in terms of how I pull data into the user interface. So, on line 78, for example, I pull in all the data from the database in this, this more simplistic uh, scenario. And so, I have that particular process in its own thread. But, that thread of execution is kicked off after... The first, the, so I got, I actually have three threads of execution. The first thread of execution establishes the overall window. That's the first thread of execution. That's your main program, the main program that we're in. It has a default single thread of execution um, that is synonymous with the program itself. So we technically have that one thread of execution. Then I have a second thread of execution that lays out the windows, sets up the tabs that you see at the top and their left side and the right side of the window. And there is some interaction with the database during that second thread of execution so that I can um, have the tabs data driven or generated based off the data or the state of the database. But then the third thread of execution, I don't want kicked off until that second thread of execution has completed. And in that second thread of execution, 
I have potentially more data involved. And so I don't want the amount of latency that I could encounter in that process to impact uh, the, pr the previous two threads of execution. And so one of the things I, I want to do is I want to use an immutable type. So I'm using a record type uh, that you see on line three. The, the, so that's one of the things driving my upgrade to uh, .NET 7 and C Sharp 11 is I want to use features that I know will provide a good long-term benefit, but I'm getting an error. The tooltip, when I hover my mouse over record, gives me an error code. And when I click on the error code, it takes me to a, a website on Microsoft's, on Microsoft.com. And the error message actually doesn't describe this, the specific situation I see here, okay? The error message is true on a general level, but it's also false on a very specific level. And so I decided to go and do some research and find out what's the deal with this record type. I kind of suspect what the real problem is. And so I'm going to create a class library, which is what I intended to do at some point, but I had postponed that decision. But let's go ahead and create a class library that is definitely set to .NET 7 and C Sharp 11, okay? And the, the kickstart for all of this is this book that I've been reading by Mark Price, Mark J. Price, titled C Sharp 11 and .NET 7. I've been reading .NET books since October of 2000 or somewhere before that. I've been reading uh, .NET books since the year 2000. And I usually read books by Andrew Trollson, but um, I decided to give Mark Price a shot and he's done a pretty good job. Um, one thing that I saw as far as recommended solutions was to um, add a fake class to your project. And I don't think that's a great idea. So I decided to find a more uh, legitimate, what I would consider a legitimate um, solution. And in this case, I found the command line tool, .NET Upgrade Assistant. And what .NET Upgrade Assistant hopefully will do is take the project that I've already written, that I've already defined in .NET 4.8.1 and upgrade it to .NET 7. So I found some, some what was probably at one time some good advice to update my app.config file with a couple of elements that would provide the pro that would expose the project to .NET 7 and C Sharp 11. Uh, setting up a project element and then a language element, lang, lang version element. Uh, but none of, none of those solutions um, actually worked. None of those solutions actually worked. And there was probably other modifications that could be made, but between reading books and searching the web, none of those solutions worked. So I decided to go with my, um, my experience and just try this tool I did. I started out with an analysis before I did an upgrade, just to make sure that there would not be any issues, because I didn't want to just jump into an upgrade and then have to spend hours trying to recover back to where I was, which with uh, the with Git would actually not be too bad, but still it, it would have been a a great inconvenience. So I went through the process of using the upgrade assistant on the command line and it uh, took longer than what um, you're seeing here because I'm this uh, this video is originally three hours but I, um, I, I, I cut a lot of it down so that you could kind of just get the gist of where we're where we are in these processes right but um, 
at the end of this process here, um, we have an upgrade to .NET 7 and C Sharp 11, and we've done it in a structured way um, that is uh, supported by Microsoft. Now, let's check that and let's see what it looks like. So when I open the properties window for this project, I am uh, greatly surprised, you know, by what I saw because it's the same Visual Studio, but the properties window is different. The properties windows is different. And so um, for this WPF pro project, right? And so it's just one of those things where there, there are workarounds and there are um, changes. And I do think installing uh, .NET 7 earlier uh, was, was beneficial. And um, I, wanna, I want to enable all warnings, right? And so that, that is some of the insights that I've gotten from uh, Mark, Mark J. Price's book. Um, and so uh, I, I thank him for those valuable insights that now are... Now that my my study of that is now in alignment with my use of this tool, so I can now move forward with um, the, the current uh, knowledge that I now have on the latest versions of uh, .NET and C Sharp. So it's all matching up now, and uh, we're ready to move forward. And you know, I don't want to do the language and uh, framework upgrades just to be doing it, but I have some legitimate uses that, um, in this case, I want to use that record type so that ultimately I, I gain um, a performance edge, right? Because immutable types are very useful for, perform for performance. It also saves you from having to do des certain design patterns that you have to code manually in order to create some form of immutability. And um, now that I've upgraded this project, I want to, what's that word? Unit test. Yes. I want to unit test. I want to uh, do a, a quick integration test just to make sure everything is on the right track. Um, so I did get a couple of errors. Again, I'm treating my, my uh, warnings as errors, right? So I can make the whole process less restrictive or or less um, less strict, but I don't like having warnings around. Um, so um, I did notice that with the Git integration in Visual Studio, that it doesn't always capture um, my intentions when using Git. So in this case, I wanted to refactor some of the classes um, in terms of the way that they're named, and in Visual Studio Past, you could rename the class and it will also rename the type or you can rename the type and it might rename the the class file right but I'm not seeing success in either direction from a git modification standpoint right so I decided to open the git command line and make those modifications manually by using a git space mv and then uh, as effect, effectively um, do a rename that is tracked by Git uh, properly. So even if I take some of those class files and I move them from the UI project to the uh, class library project, the, the, the those files retain their Git tracking history. Also, because I had to make some naming changes to that UI project, uh, when I opened Visual Studio, it was no longer visualized or or um, recalled in the solution file because the solution file the name of the project in the solution file differed from what uh, the, the, the name uh, was on the file system and so now we synchronize those two uh, synchronize those two things so that um, we, we have uh, visibility again uh, one of the things that I noticed is that there's a um, slight change to the properties and to the settings which is fine. Um, I, I've seen that before in other eras of Visual Studio um, uh, changes or .NET changes. It's so uh, not a stranger to that. And so let's get that synced up. And 
um, I do like sometimes when um, you try some of these re these automated refactorings and they get it wrong but that's fine if you know how the code is supposed to look and you know how things are supposed to be established you can you can navigate through that and so I'm going to uh, elevate the accessibility modif modifier in uh, the class library so that uh, what was previously an internal accessibility modifier, which was fine when those classes were part of the UI project, um, I now need to elevate some of those to public so that um, you know, they, they can be accessed from the they can they can be accessed from the um, the main UI project. So I want to test these changes to make sure that everything is running as it should. That even though we don't see a screen yet, because Visual Studio is doing its bookkeeping and it's doing it, its its work, which adds a little bit of over startup overhead, um, which is fine. But that's what I was looking for. So um, you're either going to get a screen or you're going to get an error message in most cases. So here I got an error message that, in this case, an exception. When I upgrade to .NET 7, the way that those types work, they work differently now. And so here I can make a small tweak to the way that I accessed SQL Server on this machine in order to allow the project to run. But I did need to add appropriate types to the class library project. So it no longer... Um, you know, had a reference to SQL client, and so I fixed that with uh, NuGet pro uh, packages. Um, and then once that was done, right, we had um, API visibility. We had API visibility. So, but now that we have the type uh, loaded properly, the way that that type is loaded or accessed, the way the API is accessed, uh, needed to needed to change. Okay, so um, so everything is running now, and now we're just waiting for the rest of the code sequences to to uh, to follow, so that we have data in the user interface. And so, what I'm seeing here is that I have a performance improvement here in terms of perceived uh, performance, such that those tabs were not immediately visible at the beginning of this process, right? But I have further performance improvements that I need to make. Yet those performance improvements will occur in another phase. And so I'm going to take that data that I'm bringing back, which was useful at the earlier uh, part of this uh, development uh, cycle. And I'm going to break that data up such that it is um, accessed in, in stages. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to have staged uh, delivery of the data uh, of the feed article data so that, um, they, that we end up with both a beneficial performance improvement in the user interface, but at the same time, the user interface remains usable in terms of um, how soon certain data is accessed. And so um, that's also to say that the same design patterns that I used in Unix, I'm sorry, Linux, to build out the application doesn't apply 100% in the Microsoft Windows environment using .NET 7 and C Sharp 11. But regardless of the differences, it's good to see that we can achieve the same overall design in terms of the user interface and we can put logic and data together in a way that uh, ultimately works. So I've posted these changes to GitHub, and if you would like to see them, you just go to github.com forward slash Michael Gaucher, click on the repositories, and you'll see um, this project listed among them. Thank you for tuning in.